Hello and welcome back to the Ten Pint Podcast. This is our first studio interview. And we're here, as if you've listened already with Beefham. Right. We're here with um, European champion boxer, Jazza Dickens. How are you, mate? Yeah, spiffing. Thanks for having me on, lads. What's it been? So, to start off with, what, what's it been like as a boxer through lockdown? Have you been like in the gym or have you been doing road work, that type of thing? I've been really lucky, really. I've been... Um, I, I come out of my last fight. My last fight was just before it happened. And then the lockdown happened. And then... I'm fighting just after it, I think. I can't announce the date yet, but I've just missed it on each side. But there's a lot of fighters out there now who've got to provide for their families, got three kids, and they just they don't know where the, the wages are coming from. You know, I've just been one of the fortunate fighters in this situation. What what um, What's like gym do you box out of? I box out of Teddy Matthews' gym, Liverpool. Oh, do you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Teddy, Teddy's my coach. Georgie Vaughan's my coach. Um, yeah, Teddy's got his own gym in the city centre. But it's mad because it's come full circle, really, the gym where it is. In the youth, it was our old youth club, the Holy Cross Youth Club, where I grew up, the area I grew up, and the school where I went to was below. So it's like being yeah. in the youth club for me. It's not actually the gym; it's like going to the club, you know. So did you just did you start off like young then? I started at the age of twelve. Um, football first, as it is for most lads here in yeah, the city. Yeah. Um, started playing football at the age of at the age of eight, eight, nine, under nines, under tens. So I was over age, and um, and then got into boxing. And I um, I done one more season with the football, but my boxing just took over. Just as a, as a passion for, for boxing more than football. So like like straight away, you, did you know you were always wanted to be a boxer as soon as you started? Yeah, when I went to the gym, I remember looking around. There was there was a picture of John Conti on the wall. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a WBC belt on him, the green one, and I thought I want that. That's that's what I want. So on day one, I remember thinking that, and um, I remember trying to escape. I could box, I could fight. He was a kid in our school. He was a good good boxer. And um, no one in the school, and he said he, he can box over yeah. here. So I sparred with him two days in. And he held me on. I didn't get the better, not just held me on. I knew, I knew I had it a little bit. So I thought, yeah, I'm gonna, gonna do this. I'm gonna commit to this, and it gave me, give me a release, um, a release from normal life, from normality. It was a nice change. It was like the film Avatar, seeing where he's, uh, he's living his own, own life. He's yeah. quite unhappy, and he goes into the Avatar. <laughs> that, that's what it was like for me, you know. So it was, a, it was a great escape for me, and it was, um, it was everything that everything could ask for. I got the attention of the coaches, and, um. Yeah, it felt a bit special sort of thing. The coaches took a lot for the kids in the area and the community and like the youth workers and stuff like that. So it was, yeah. it was good for me. I like, I went to um, Longmore ABC for about two weeks, right? It's one of the, you know, you're you watching Rocky, you're watching that yeah. type of thing. And then um, I'm thinking, oh, I'll have a go at that. So I've went, right, and I've just had the shock of my life. I'm thinking, <laughs> this is hard, this is hard. This isn't just throwing punches, it's footwork, it's, it's everything, isn't it? Yeah. yeah so yeah. it made me think, oh, that's hard like to do you know what I mean so like do, when you were like a child then do you have any type of I just obviously you just mentioned John Conti have you had anyone else like through the from the city or even from anywhere else that inspired you to sort of not to box no it was a mad one um, no no one in my family didn't know anyone my cousin used to go to the gym that's who I started going with his dad took me with him in the house used to say on the pads as you do we laugh I let punch his hands or whatever and um, press ups in the house and stuff like that but it was never never boxing I didn't know any boxers they um, the only professional I box, the boxer who I met was at the age of 15. I started at 12, and the first time I met a professional boxer who we knew and had a relationship was a guy called Francis Hans. Yeah. We went to train in his gym as the gym was getting done up, so we went to his gym, and he was the first fella I ever met. So three years in, I didn't know nothing about the pro game. I just always knew he wanted to be a professional, and um, yeah, he was the first guy I ever met. It was his man when I went to a pro show with my amateur coach, and it was just different. It was like the, the gloves were smaller, it, it, like... The, yeah, the head garden as well. Yeah, it was just yeah. a hostile environment for for the child to be in. I thought at the time, so it was um, it was it was unusual to say this is what I want to do in the future. Although it was scary to see these grown men, you know, like chisels fighting, yeah, yeah. like blood flying, blood and sweat flying <laughs> everywhere yeah. when they're fighting. So it was a, it was a mad experience to say this is what I want to do. And like, although it's scary, it's still something that I want to do. You know. How did your family react when you said you want to be a boxer? Because I think I've already said, on like your mum or yeah, whatever, to be a bit like, whoa, you know what I mean? Yeah, I thought I loved it. Well, it, it. Before, I I was fighting a lot in the street in the school, and the, and my father was the caretaker in the school one day, and I had a fight after school, and uh, my father was walking home from his job too. So my dad ends up there as I'm fighting, and like he said, he didn't know whether to stop it or to let it carry on or whatever, but... He ends up, it was the 90s, <laughs> it was the 90s, yeah. the early 2000s, it was a lot, you know what I mean? So he watched the fight, and um, after he said, Why didn't you stop fighting and go down to the gym, lads? And I said, All right, then I go down to the gym, and then that was it, that's how I started. So, like, do you know, what was your biggest achievements in the amateurs? Because I, I think a lot of people don't realise with the amateurs and stuff. 
it is very different. You can be a fan, like for example, you can be a fantastic amateur boxer, you can win Olympic medals and stuff, but then you go into the pros and it's under the light, it's different, isn't it? It's it's totally different. People can't explain how, how different it is. It's like it's like pool and snooker, you know. Yeah. That's what it's like, that's a comparison. Um just two totally different sports. Even when you turn professionals only four rounds, that's just different to the amateurs. And then a professional title fight, which is twelve rounds, that's different from a four round fight. So it just progresses like that. Um you will have a bit of steel in you to turn professional, I would say, because it's different, do you know what I mean? The, yeah. the, just a little punches because the gloves are so small. The first punch I got it with, I said, oh, wow, can you swear? <laughs> can you swear to you? Yeah, <laughs> I said, oh, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought, wow, I've never been hit like that. You just get flashed, you know what I mean? I, like, you, you, can only, you can only be a little jab and you, just, like, you see stars and stuff like that. But yeah. with the amateurs, you've got a head guard on, you've got big 10 ounce gloves and you don't feel nothing really. You can get it 10 times and, and you just feel nothing. But then with the pros, you can just get tapped and you, and you see stars. So it's just a different game, you know? Where's it, where's it come about knowing the transition from amateur to pro? When do you know when's the right time to do it? And how did it happen for you? I don't know. But, um, it's it's an individual thing. When you said then, what was my... I didn't answer the question, did I, about the amateur achievements. Mm. Um, I turned pro at 19. I went in the senior ABAs. I only had five senior fights. That's like five fights as a man. Yeah. And turned professional. So I'm fighting for professional titles as a boy really, do you know what I mean? I should have, I should have waited longer. I've been professional for ten years and I'm only twenty nine now, do you know what I mean? So it's a long time. It's a short career. I was ranked I was in the top ten in the world. I was a um, European bronze medalist and I, I had a chance to go to the world championships as a junior but I was uh, misbehaving on, on the training camp. It was just, just like, oh, fuck it, you know what I mean? Just, yeah. just like different ways. Treating everyone like a, like a school teacher and all the authorities and the great the coaches and all yeah, that. Yeah. And my mentality was daft. It was just like treating them like school teachers, trying to get away with all sorts. It was just, <laughs> it was just like a, just an idiot, do you know what I mean? So, so I ruined a lot of chances for myself. And I, said, I always wanted to be professional. So we're turned professional. Too young, really, do you know what I mean? But it took me a few years. I'm only coming into my own now as a professional, but it took me a good few years to settle in. Like you say, that transition, it's not it's not easy. It's, it's, it's like I say, imagine playing pool and then laying off the yeah. snooker, you know. So obviously, like your first fight was against Pavlov Senkov. Pavel Senkov. Yeah. Remember that far back, low like, But um, <laughs> yeah. So what was that like? Your first fight It was in Liverpool Olympia. Yeah, it was on Terry Terry Matthews, my coach. Now it was on his undercard. He was fighting a guy called Scotty Law, and so like I had my. For years, I grew up as a kid with posters of Zelly on my wall and all these Liverpool fighters like Sir Paul Smith. Um, who else was the Jamie McKeever, Courtney Fry, all these people on, on my bedroom wall. And then I'm fighting on the undercard of yeah. my, like, these people who have been around growing up, professional fighters. Um, it was a great experience. I remember coming out, coming, it was in the Olympia, there's a stage on the Olympia, and the stairs were coming off the stage. And he played me song I chose to um, play Sol's Gleal by Peter Gabriel. And yeah. I, um, when we just started walking, I thought this is great. I love it. Like you could see the like the it's a like a cauldron, isn't it? The Olympia. Yeah, absolutely. So it was like a, um, it was a boss atmosphere. It, it, there was a lot of noise for me and stuff like that. Loads of people came. So I thought I'm gonna soak this up here. Yeah. So I'm like I'm not going. I'm just standing there. I'm just waiting. <laughs> I mean, my coach punched me in the back and said, "Fucking move." <laughs> <laughs> so I just to get in there and um, I thought I was soaking up, but he weren't, he weren't having none of it. So, but it was a good experience. So like moving forward from that, what was your first like title fight? Was it the English title or the Northern Area or anything like that? Um, my first professional title was the English title, yeah. Yeah. And um, who, was, who was that against? That was against the guy called John Fernandez. And it was a strange fight. It was a mad fight, really. I, I used to kill myself to make the weight. And um, I got down too far. And, and after the weigh-in, you like it. Um, no one, no one. You you put food in a dog's bowl, <laughs> and you say just don't eat it. Yeah, he, he's not gonna listen. Is he? he's just gonna eat and eat and eat and eat and eat? And that's what I was like at the time. As um, soon as I'd been weighed in, because come from the amateurs, you weigh you weigh in two hours before the fight. But now you're weighing in the day before the fight, and you can eat whatever you want. You can be hydrated and after yeah. that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I was. Um, I, I I went to the barbecue and I had food poisoned. Ooh. Food, yeah. <laughs> food poisons have a barbecue in my house and cooked the meat <laughs> and I just ate it all so then I, I went to the fight I had like bad cramps and that and I, I was getting it to the stomach and it was like probably the worst pain I felt in me, in boxing last, like just wins it for the full fight really yeah. but I managed to get a, get the win like a, um, getting the English title it was a nice feeling going home to my bed and at the time we only had one, one, one child then and it was good, you know what I mean? It was a nice, nice feeling to go home with the bells and that. Is that the Echo Arena, was it? Yeah. 
Yeah, what was that yeah. like? Was it was it like quite full at that point? Yeah, or? it was boss because years before I I'd been walking down there with my mum when it was getting built. I was just a kid at the time. I said I'm on a boxing day one day, mum, and that, that's where my first <laughs> title was. I went on to win a British title in there. Yeah, I think four for a few titles in there, so yeah, it's great experience to be fighting in there and winning my first title in there. Yeah, do, do, do you sell a lot of tickets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah I don't think people realise that like the boxers do actually have to sell their own tickets at yeah. times. It's not like most businesses, to be honest. It's a, um, it's an harsh business, really harsh yeah. business. Fighters going into the business, they don't understand that it's a business because they're coming from the amateur system where they just looked after and, they, and the, everything's paid for, all expenses. Um, but now they, they're fighting as a professional. They have to, they have to raise the money for their opponent, which is going to cost them for a four-round fight. It's going to cost them £1,200 at least just for the opponent to come in. Then you're going to have to pay a bit of expenses to be on the show and then you have to split the tickets. So you probably have to, to make £500 after like a, a six to eight week camp. It's not a lot, is it? Like saying like professional, it's not a lot of money. It's, and and that's just like um, if they sell over under tickets, you know. So you don't make a lot at the start. I've I've seen a lot of that, like with um, do you know, for example, I know it's different, but the UFC, like a lot of them, because of the COVID, you've trained at the fight camp, mm. and then it's been cancelled last minute. But they they don't make that money back then. You no. pay for the whole camp, pay for the coaches, the nutrition, yep. everything that's out of it. So I think. I think people it's more than just punching people in the face, isn't it? No, really, I've got got there. Me, me, Shaq Russell, fighter from around here. You might know him. Um, he's he's just had a layoff, changed gyms, got himself in great shape, just ready to go back into the, into into his fights. And then the COVID happened. You know, he gave his job up. He's got three kids. He gave his job up to focus on the trainer and all that. So it's not just he's not losing the fight. He's actually losing wages, and he's paying for the wages. He's paying out of his own pocket to get in good shape. And now, yeah. now it's off. You know. In your 17th fight, it was your first challenge for them, the British Super Bantamweight title against Kid Galahad. Yeah. He's normally Barry as well, isn't he? Um, and that was that was out, that was in Rotherham. Was that sort of like an away fight for you? Because yeah. he's from that area, Sheffield, isn't he? Yeah. They, yeah. Well, well, what happens, um, they also they have a purse bid. It's called a purse bid. So two promoters will bid to stage the fight. His promoter yeah. won the fight and he held it in his hometown. So you want the home advantage, blah, blah, blah. You want the crowd and all that. So, yeah. It was my first experience as a um, it was my first real fight really. You know, like you'd have you'd have fights. It's smoke and mirrors. I was I think I was must have been seventeen and all. I haven't really fought no one great at the time. Yeah. But it was my first first f- proper fight and, and I lost. It was the only time I've ever been on a canvas and it was a tough one. It was a tough one to take because I say there before it I had like sixty amateur fights. That was seventeen professional fights. I'd never been on a canvas and it was hard, it was hard pill to swallow, you know, it was a really tough time for me af- afterwards. So you know, I had, to, uh, I had to come back. I had to bounce back from it. But it was, it was a really tough time. It is tough time for any any young fighter to lose. You know, like yeah. his first fight. And at the time, we were both tipped to be young fighter of the year. So there was a lot of pressure on the fight and all that. So yeah, it was a good experience. All in all, would you say because um, he had it like closer to home with like more crowd on his side as such? Would you say that had an impact on it? No, no, not not really. Mm. Possibly not. No, I think the fighter when when he's in there. He, he doesn't he doesn't see all that you know yeah you, you hear you hear a few voices so i can hear me that voice in a, in a room full of people it's mad you can tune into certain voices but sometimes you'll hear the odds like swear words someone shouting dead violently <laughs> if he's o- over the top and that but you don't really hear nothing else apart from apart from the fight you know all your coaches who you tuned into you've got this strange ability to tune into one voice it's mad mm. so then you went on then in your um 20th fight to then fight against josh wade and um or just whale. Yeah. Whale or whale. Whale, yeah. <laughs> um, at the Echo Arena, and you're actually, like, was victorious that time winning the British title. Yeah, well, that fight was like redemption for me. So, because I lost for the British title, and then came back to fight for the British title, I knew I, I couldn't lose again, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Josh Whale, I think he's already fought for titles, British titles before, and um, he was a lot more experienced than me, Josh Whale. And um, everything I'd done on the Galata fight, I'd done on the the... the prior to the Josh Whale fight because I just like had to correct these demons, you know what I mean? So I went to the same restaurants after the weigh-in. I done absolutely everything yeah. the same, do you know what I mean? There's a lot of things that it was just like redemption for me and, and getting a bit of sight was a nice feeling and then um, I think I got one defence one defence like against um, a guy called Martin Ward. Yeah. In Newcastle it was. It was a mad, mad, mad night. <laughs> <laughs> they put me in like the um, the changing room was smaller than this. 
it's where the ice, the, you know, where the, the the bar staff are coming in to get the ice. Yeah. The tunnel's in like the corner, was in this like weird sense in in northeast, and that was like a proper hostile environment. Um, Is he a Jersey? Yeah. Yeah. He, he's a tablet from from the northeast. Oh, that, yeah. That's where he's based. Yeah. So he's um, that was a good one. That was my first defense of the the business title afterwards. So then you you went forward after that, and you've um, you challenged for the WBA Super. If anyone doesn't know about the belts with like boxing, they think you obviously know like the WBA. You can be the WBA regular champion. You can also be the WBA super champion. Yeah, but yeah. Like, it's confusing, isn't it? Yeah. You've got it, like, it, yeah. Do you call it the world title? I just call it the world title and the one below. You know that. Yeah. To people who know who know know about boxing, it's, it's not actually the world title. Is it the regular? And it, and so you challenge for the WBA super and lineal super bantamweight. I think lineals where it's sort of the man. It's like beat the man before him, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so, so you challenge against for um, for that against Guillermo Rigondeau. I think mean, yeah. he's one of the most decorated amateurs, isn't he? A Cuban. Yeah, yeah. What was yeah. what was that like going in with him? Do you feel like feel like that was a bit early in your career, or do you feel like you were ready for Possibly, that? Possibly, yeah. It was, it was it was early in my career. I I was training. There was one. I, I was training for the European title, the EBU European title. I was training for that at the time. I got the phone call. Do you want to fight with Gondo? He's coming to England. He's looking for an opponent. Would you like to fight him? And I threw me European title shot off to fight him. I jumped at the chance. And um, looking back, I, I didn't have to. I didn't have to do that. I could have just won the European title and steadily, steadily built myself. But I was too young and I was like, I was, um, it was eager. It was so eager to just yeah. to fight for the world title. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's what you dream of as a kid. I used to have an ex- um, the PlayStation and he was on the game. So it was always <laughs> something I said I'm going to do. And when the, and you think, like, if I don't fight him now, I'll never get the chance, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'll never get the chance to win. Will I ever get another chance to win a world title? Young and naive, do you know what I mean? You will. But at the time, when you say that to you, you don't think, you don't. Like, imagine, imagine getting told, like, you're going to start, you're going to start for Burnley every week yeah. or you can go to Man U now and be on the bench, do you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah. no, nah, I'm going to man you. Because you know, you're, not, you're not old enough to think that way. So you know it's I mean? early enough in your career as well, isn't it? So if yeah. you do get beat, it's no disgrace, is it? Yeah, you yeah. can come back from it. Yeah, of course. I, I, I didn't expect it to end the way in because I got a broken jaw. Yeah. So I spent six months out, so it didn't do me any favours, to be honest. It didn't do me any favours to be, be out of the ring for six months. Um, looking back in hindsight, I probably should have took me time and, and improved as... As, as I should have, you know what I mean, yeah. rather than just jump at the chance. I, I don't think really had anyone around me to say, like, this is the way the game works, Jazz, and this is the way you take your yeah. time, you know what I mean? I didn't have anyone like that around me. Is so, it your decision to take the fight, or, like, yeah, is you, you, who was your promoter, like, then? Nobody, Frank Nobody. Warren. Frank Warren, yeah. but when in contact with him, it's just, like, fighting on his show sort of thing, so, yeah, yeah. so I didn't have a promoter. He, he, he actually, he wouldn't advise me what's best for me. He went in my interest. He was in Rogondo's interest and his own interest. So to have somebody like Rogondo on his show, yeah. that's what he wants. You know what I mean? He's not. He's not too bothered about me. You know, that's the way it works. It's cutthroat. Cut Is it a lot business. like that? Because like we do, obviously we've done music video, like uh, music interviews, and a lot of the bands have said, um, like they, it's from a lot of the people in the industry are out to get you. Do you, you feel like it's like it. that a lot? Yeah, you wouldn't believe it. I, I wouldn't say it's so much out to get you. Yeah, I would say, but it's like everyone's out for themselves. And there's nothing wrong with that, is there? But as long as you know it. But a lot of kids go into the to the sport thinking that everyone wants to support them. But you will be given this this um the idea that everyone's supporting you because they're on your team. And yeah. You're promoting, you're manager. But the truth is, everyone's in it for themselves. You know what I mean? It's just a business. So then you went on after that, and you you um, you lost like consecutively lots again against Thomas Patrick Ward. Yeah. And that was um, in the first direct arena in Leeds. Yeah. So what was that like having two losses on it, like in a row? Tough. So so tough because you start questioning yourself as like confidence wise, and yeah. you know what I mean, you start questioning yourself. I didn't have a warm up fight after a fight. I spent six months out with a broken jaw because you can't spar not for six months. So then, like, he even took a punch or lands a punch for the first six months, and then the fight opportunity got given to me. So it was um, I was rusty really. I was so rusty, and looking back on the fight, I shouldn't have. In a bad place after a fight, I left. I left the gym I was at to join with him. Um, I went to America after that to go and like revive my career. But at the yeah. time, it, I, I went in a good place and me me performance showed. You know what I mean? It, it was a um, it was a night clash. We clashed heads in the round nine or ten it was, and he got cut. 
But the fight got stopped, and and he was like, the ref- they went to the scorecards, and he was up by two rounds on the scorecards. But he got cut. He got so cut. How, how does that work then? Is it like why is he winning the fight then? Well, he got cut and had to pull out. So they call it accidental, accidental leg clash. So he's now, it's not his fault. It's yeah. not my fault. Mm. So the fairest thing to do is go to the scorecards. You know what I mean? I was coming into the fight with two rounds to go, and two rounds behind. So it was like it was a bit of my one. But looking back, it was a blessing in disguise because. I am um, revived my career after that. Yeah. As you can imagine, three losses now as a pro <laughs> doesn't look good, you know what I mean? Doesn't look good at all. So um I, I, I went to America. So to revive my career, fought out there and um I went and signed the the fifty gym in Miami and I fought in with them in Dominican Dominican Republic and then came home and I Have you seen that on your record? It was like England, England, <laughs> England, weren't it? And it was like Dominican <laughs> Republic and like, why's he over there? How did that come about? Well when uh, at the time my half I was going on holiday with his mates. And his mate dropped off the holiday and said to me, do, would you want to take my uh, my place on the holiday? You know, like the, the flight changes or whatever and just go with them. So said, oh, yeah, that'd be good. I'll go down to Miami and I'll get, get, get some um, sparring in the first eight gym or whatever. And um, when I was there, he said, would you like to fight for us? We'd love to have you. So that, that, that's how I came about. I ended up going to stay there with them. I was staying with um, a Cuban. A Cuban. I think it was a Cuban, a Colombian, or something. South American speakers, no one spoke English. It was, it was in like the ghetto, and like no one spoke English in this little <laughs> yeah. fight house. It was weird, sleeping on a bunk bed in a living room, no telly. It was just like, it was just like a mad, mad, <laughs> mad thing. Was your family never went over with you or nothing? Really? No, no, no. So, what I've done, the last of my wages from them fights, yeah. it was like a gamble. What are we going to do here? Are we gonna, are we going to risk it and like settle for, you know, mediocre lifestyle, or are we just going to. Spend the last of our money and me going to try and revive my yeah. career, sort of thing. So we took we took the gamble and and it paid off big time. Cause since then, my career's just gone up and up and up. Since I've come home with me co- coach here, Daddy and Georgie Vaughan. You said it's like a blessing in disguise, really. Yeah, that's yeah. what I meant when I said that about the, the Tommy War fight. Um, enough is enough. I was sick of being unhappy. Things have gone too far, and I just thought I'm gonna make a make a change and revive my career. You mentioned that you went to America. How long were you over there for? Um, two months. Over two months. Two months. Yeah. yeah. At the time, I started learning to speak a bit of Spanish, Spanish and all that. <laughs> no, because I was living with the Cubans and yeah. all that. Because <laughs> I was saying about the food and that before, the first thing I learned was all like the foods. <laughs> <laughs> learning how to say eggs, chicken, lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> is that, do you know what I'm talking about food? Is it hard? Do you have like a dietitian or do you have to plan all that out yourself? Yeah. Because like I'm, with us, we, sorry, we, can, we can just eat what we want, can't we? Yeah. But like, yeah. if it's your job, you yeah, need well, to like... Well, I was fighting at eight stone ten at that time. Yeah. So nine stone, I fight at now. So it's underweight, isn't it, for a normal man? Do you know what I mean? Nine stone, but, like, it's not, it's not normal, is it? So it's like about packing the most muscle in to your body and the least amount of fat, but healthy, because you go too low with the weight, you then weak. Do you know what I mean? You're yeah, weak and so. So uh, I'm lucky enough to work with John Moore's university. Um, there's a coach called Car- Carl Evans. He's the sports scientist. There's probably like number five in the world for top sports science yeah. coaches. I'm lucky enough to to be in there. I'm like a guinea pig for him and, and he uses me as test results and that's so I'm really, really blessed to be able to work with him, you know. And he so gives me he gives me sorry, he gives me a um, he gives me a camp approach to diet. So he tells Prep for Success, the meal prep company, he tells them what to feed me. So yeah. I don't do nothing, I just get Steve. told what to do and, and it works, you know. Do you find it hard around like certain times? Because I think this year I seen there was a lot of shows around like the Christmas period and that. Christmas, yeah. What's that like? Do you have, is that like making sacrifices? Yeah. Or can you just have like a normal Christmas that week and I'll just eat what no, we want? I haven't had a Christmas dinner for years. Last time I had a Christmas dinner. I, I'm up at six o'clock morning. Six o'clock. I, I run at six o'clock on a Christmas morning and I have done for the last ten years just because sacrifice as it is. Do you know what I mean? But Christmas dinner, it's not like it's only it's only um it's only chicken and veg in it really or meat and veg. No. I'll have that but like gravy is not I can't have gravy. <laughs> So obviously after you've had your two losses, you've then went on to um, to win the vacant RBF European featherweight title thing. That's what's next to me here, is it? Yeah. 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 I feel like the European champion myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so you've um, you've went on to win that. So what was that like? Like that, stepping up in a level from a British level? That was a good experience, that because the, the guy who was boxing. I got one fight beforehand. I was in Spain sparring with um, John O'Callaghan. He was fighting against Seven Farmer for the world title. And he asked me to spar as we were both southpaws. So I went out there to spar with him. And at the time, the guy who manages for MTK was my old teammate, Tom Stalker. Yeah. 
he's now manager at MTK and he said to me, there's a show on Liverpool Jazz and we're looking for someone to top it. You're not an MTK fighter, but we're looking for fighters. Do you want to be on the show? Do you want to top it for, it was in, um, I think it was a Commonwealth title eliminator. And I said, I'd love to because it's either fight at home in the Olympia, I can be with my family or go back to America. Because yeah. at the time I signed, a, signed in, um, a contract in America to fight out there in um, LA. So, I'd, um, I said, fucking right, yeah, it's not what it seems out there. You know, one wants to be out there away from the family, do you know what I mean? That's the most yeah. important thing I've got. And um, if I just think that the bright lights are in America and all that, but it's not. There's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities here, do you know what I mean? And that, that's one thing I realised when through that, that period. So I said, yeah, I'd love to fight here in the Olympia. Um, and I fought against a guy called Nasibi Ramadan for the Commonwealth title eliminator. And um, it was probably probably the best win I've ever had and I knocked him out in the fourth round. It was a great it was a great knockout and it and it sparked a bit of incest. So he said, yeah. Now we've got a guy who does fight for the for MTK. You can fight against them for the IBF European title if you want to and that'll put you in the rankings for the world title for the IBF. You go in the top ten if you can win that title. So I took that fight as well. I was that confident and I was that desperate to revive my career. I signed to fight Nathaniel May the day before I'd already boxed in the CB Ramadan. Yeah. So then consecutive fights, eight weeks on eight weeks and eight weeks after I won them two fights, I beat Nathaniel May. That was great experience to get the belt to get a belt back, just to have a belt because once you got a belt, you know you're gonna have a defence. Yeah. You know yeah. What I mean? So um yeah, the ball starts rolling after that because then after that I got entered into the Golden Contact tournament, which was a um, massive, massive opportunity. And I could still stay here along with my coaches, Terry and George. So after that, um, we went and had the first fight. Eight weeks after that was in the Golden Contact tournament. So what was that like, the Golden Contact? I, I think a lot of people would have seen it. It was on Sky Sports. There was it eight fighters in your weight yeah. division, yeah? Yeah, so there's going to be eight fighters. And the exciting part about it, you would draw a ball out of an ass. And that's how you would pick it. Oh, it's like it, yeah. not like a child's game of manners, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it was just like, it was, it was great entertainment. It was great value for money for the fighters, for the fans. And um, so there was eight fighters. I think there was, I think there was three European titles, a British title. I think there was a Latin a WBC title. Everyone in there had a title, so everyone was good fighters. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think most of them were ranked. So I think everyone was ranked inside the top ten in the world. So it's a great tournament to to be in. And um, the first fight was against Carlos Ramos. He was European EU EBU champion. Sorry about all these letters. EBU <laughs> 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 champion. And um. Yeah, he, um, he was the first win. He, he, he That was a good win. I won convincingly there. And then the semi-final. I defended my belt. But I didn't win his title because through politics of boxing, the IBF, sorry, there's a little few letters again, IBF and the EBU, <laughs> yeah. they are different organisations. Yeah. I don't know if you follow this, but the different organisations which will not work with each other in this situation. So they pulled his belt out. So only mine was on the line. So I won that and defended my own belt and I kept my belt. And then the next fight was against Lee Woods, who had the Commonwealth title and the WBO European title. Yeah. More politics came in and the Commonwealth wasn't on the line. So the last two fights I should have won the Commonwealth and the another European. But you're title. defending your belt. Yeah, my belt's on the line, but through this time I should be also Commonwealth and another European title. It's not really fair, is it? So it's like, like you, you have more to lose than then. If they lose, they still have the title. Yeah. It doesn't really make sense, does it? It's, mad. it's a bit of a mad one, but it's it's just how it goes, you know what I mean? Because you're getting you're getting ranked and now I'm ranked number three in the world and with the IBF and I'm ranked with the WBO, but I won the WBO European <laughs> more or less. <laughs> I won the WBO European title, so now with um I'm in a good position. I'm I'm ranked in two governing bodies, the WBO and the IBF and um yeah I'm close to a world title shot but this this I've got the final coming up. Um, a date yet to be announced. Um, that I've got the final against Ryan Walsh, who was yeah. the British champion. But after t- after the end of the, he got stripped of the British through more politics of boxing. So yeah. it would have been the British Commonwealth and European titles in the final. But um, as after all them belts by so winning in this. the final, what's on the line? Then? My one, the show one <laughs> again, <yeah. laughs> once again. <laughs> so with that golden contract, what is like? What is the golden contract? It's a contract with um, one of the biggest promotional companies in the world. Um, a massive deal for me, life changing, life changing opportunity and life changing financial position for me. You know, and um, everyone going into it, it was a good position. It was a good like. It was a great opportunity for anyone. They were getting paid double what they should be. Do you know what I mean? It was just like a massive, massive. Yeah. 
opportunity and every t- every time you fight the money's going up and up and every time you knock somebody out you get getting knockout bonuses so it's just you a bonus even from knockouts knockout bonuses yeah and the, and knockout bonuses were doubling every if you got one you got two and you get three knockout yeah. bonuses they're doubling doubling so it's just like great opportunity and with, with coming out of it with a contract led towards fighting for a world title you know so it was just it was a great opportunity and now, now i'm in the final when do you have any idea when the final will be? Obviously, with the cold, I have, but I can't. But I can't. I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> Ten fights exclusive. <laughs> um, so is that with Matchroom? Am I right in saying the the show is yeah. by Matchroom? Well, yeah, Matchroom work with Sky, so with uh, MTK Global, yeah. who's a management company. It's called the MTK. Con- <laughs> more or less is um, <laughs> MTK Sky and Matchroom. Yeah. So which guy obviously like matching the tired into like Ed the hands, aren't they? Yeah. Have you met Eddie in? Yeah, years ago. Like when I fought in the English title in Yahoo, yeah, it was his bill that I went on to. So I met him back then, yeah. Was was he all right? Because he gets a lot of sticks. But no, we well, he's a gentleman, you? you know. He's a gentleman. Is is people are just jealous? Aren't they? You know what I mean? Someone's yeah. doing well. You you can only judge. He's getting booed, by... don't he? Any <laughs> <laughs> time, like just put on a big show at Wembley, like Anthony Joshua's defended all his belts and boo. You know yeah, what I mean? What, what, what more did he want? I think you can only judge, judge your success these days on the social media by your negative comments. Really, can't you? Yeah. No, no one likes someone who's doing well. It's it's just like it's just a way. I don't know what it is in England or Britain. Do you just like a loser, don't you? Or do you like a comeback An story? type thing. Oh, all it's the time, isn't it? Yeah, you can't do well without getting getting lasers on. It's like now. <laughs> it's like um, with Fury and Joshua. Everyone's on Fury's side now, aren't they? Yeah. Joshua hasn't done anything wrong. Yeah. Like <laughs> Joshua has more belts yeah. than him. It's like Do you remember the years ago as well when there was a, a potential fight with the uh, Tyson Fury and David Price? Yeah, yeah. No one liked Fury, no one's ever good way said about him, but now everyone's team Fury and, and Joshua is the bad guy now, isn't he? So it's mad. Yeah, so um what would you say your highest point in boxing was and also your lowest point? Mm. Lowest point was probably after the four, four for the British title for the first time and lost. I was probably like I could say like when when suicidal but it was it was heavy, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I was having like thoughts and that it was, it was like I couldn't understand why people choose that path. It was it was heavy, yeah. it was deep, do you know what I mean? And at the time I I was already booked at Aldi, me and Miguel and my lab we went away on Aldi and they're having the Aldi and these are my thoughts on Aldi, do you know what I mean? So that mm. that's how dark a place that was. The best point is um, always coming home with the titles. Every title I've come home, I put it on my bed. We sacrifice so much. You give it to me bed, my kids. We get the pictures. It's just nice, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like lovely, lovely moment. You can't, you can't buy it. You have to win it. You have to win yeah, it. Yeah. You have to earn it. You know what I mean? It's priceless. So, um, what would you say the best thing about being a boxer is? But yeah, there's so many, you know. Um, you can start from a child. The respect they give you. The discipline that you you grow up with, the um, respect for everything in life, and you know what it's like to get a smack. So therefore, your respect is heightened even more. You know, a disrespectful person. You know how to you know how to have manners. Your coaches t- install this into the kids as well. People, parents, you see kids going into like the into the boxing gym. They're scared. You saying before your mum was a worry if you're going yeah. to the gym and all that, but the respect you're gonna get and the discipline that you're gonna gain for it, you're gonna you're gonna take this into every aspect of your life once you've come out of a boxing gym. Do you know yeah. what I mean? That that's how it starts. Um, I I get to, I get to live at home. It's hard. It's not, it's not an easy career. It's hard. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I get to stay. I get to like see my kids every day. Do you know what yeah. I mean? I'm not I'm not like carrying shit around the, the scrap yard. Do you know what I mean? And like having to lay break and. I'm going to the gym and enjoying what I do. I get freedom. I get like freedom yeah. of of my life. It's it's not always financially rewarding either, but you get the perks. Like you get family time. The most important things that matter. You know, you, you, you get to live with yeah. your family. You get to live. That's that's it. You get to live. Do you know what I mean? As mm. a fighter, you probably get to live. It's hard, but it's rewarding. So you get to live a, a proper life. If that makes sense, I don't know. Yeah. So would you say you're reaching your peak now? Like, what are your plans for when you eventually will retire? Fuck knows. Um, I've, never, <laughs> never, I've never like thought about retiring. I don't know when when, I'm, when I got a broken jaw. The doctor said you won't box again, and I'm like me ass drunk and thought fuck you. Will do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I can't think about not fighting. That that that's all I know because I've been doing this since I was so young. That's all I know. But it probably be something with boxing. I've got I've got many talents. You know what I mean? I'm not just not just a 
believe it or not, <laughs> not just a monk. <laughs> not just a monk. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, uh, there's, there's many things I can do, and there's many avenues to go down within the boxing world, and there's many avenues to go down in life, um, in business. So I, 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 my main focus is being a dad, because you have to sacrifice so much time with your kids, and yeah. that's probably the most important thing that I can say I'm going to do after boxing is, is being a father, you know, I've got three kids. And a family man, me, me bed also gives up so much time. My parents yeah. do, I've still got two parents, very lucky and blessed with family. So just be a family man. That, yeah. that's... So, how many? Um, you said you've got three kids, yeah, yeah. Are they like a mixture of boys and girls, or yeah, two boys and a girl? So, what would you think about if your two sons went into boxing? Would you want them to do it? It's a hard one, you know. It's a hard one. I would say, I would say, to, I don't know, how could I, how could I love it so much and then advise them not to do it? You know, you're yeah. an example for them as well, aren't you? Like your yeah. dad's won like these titles, he's been in these fights. They're gonna want to be like you, aren't they? Yeah. And at the same time, you're like, do they really need to do it? Like that's 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 what I'm thinking. Like I'd love to be able to be in a position where they can do whatever they choose and not like, and they don't ever feel pressure to be like me. You know what yeah. I mean? They can be their own people and they can do their own thing in life. Um, if they want to do boxing, I would advise it. Yeah, because it's a great life. If they feel pressure, you know, I always say to my kids, "What are you gonna be when you're older?" Because we know the answer is, "I'm gonna be happy, Dad," and that's that. You know what I mean? Yeah, Just being yeah. happy. If, it, if boxing makes them happy, do it. If it doesn't make you happy, <laughs> do not do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's too hard to be second best. Yeah. So if you son the go professional lot, either of them, I think you've seen like Chris Eubank Junior and Chris Eubank Senior. He's literally just there all the time with him. <laughs> so like. It's like, it's like your dad going to pub with you all the time. And just sat, sat there and like, <laughs> you know what I mean? He's constantly on his shoulder. You, would you yeah. like sort of take a, like just give advice and take a backward step? Or I would think you, you be would like, have to, wouldn't you? But, but these are stupid people. These are very intelligent people. Yeah. And what you don't understand, Chris Eubank Jr., would have he ever got where he's at now if his dad weren't standing there? Yeah. Because I can't see it, do you know what I mean? He lost a bit of titles and he gets Billy Joe Saunders. Yeah. Um, where would you go after that? Do you know what I mean? I think the hatred that that is um is generated to that they know what to do, know exactly what to do, yeah. and his dad's a smart man. His dad knows exactly what he's doing. Do you know what I mean? I think that's why he's getting opportunity after opportunity off this yeah. off this image that he's creating. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was just they they both go on and they laugh, or they both move out the press conference. They both go their own way and they laugh and they say, "See, I was <laughs> I was playing the game." Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they're not stupid people. It's, it's like, it's a, it's a business, you know. What would you say the best piece of advice you've been given by someone is? Um, not even boxing related or? Yeah, boxing related, boxing yeah. Boxing related, um, it's just, it's like the cliches that um, they're not listened to enough because people just, because it's a cliche, you just think it's a cliche, oh, fuck, I've heard it all before, do you know what I mean? But yeah. they are the best. The cliches are the best, otherwise they wouldn't stand the test of time, do you know what I mean? So, just hard work, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Hard work, you've got to sacrifice, that's it. Hard work and sacrifice, that's, that's it, really. Hmm. Who's the most famous person you've got on your phone book? In terms of boxing <laughs> and book. stuff? <laughs> your phone book, I'm sure you don't have a little book with numbers written down. <laughs> um, probably my manager, my manager, Tony Belly. He's, he's oh, is he your champion, manager? Is he yeah. Yeah. He's world champion, so, yeah. But in the boxing community, I think we all know each other. Yeah, yeah. probably you have to throw throw Tony's name in there. <laughs> <laughs> he's on everything now, isn't he? he? Has a little Rocky film. He's had the SIS thing. Did you yeah. watch that? Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Really. Would you go on anything like that? So like, obviously after you're yeah. retired, probably. I'd love to, yeah. No, what yeah. I like to do the big grills, the island one. Have yeah. you seen the island? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look after myself, sort of thing. Find a way to live. I like, I like stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. You're a red or a blue? Blue. A wire, yeah, yeah. wear blues yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. And I'll be miserable together about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, that was Jazza Dickens, and it was with me, Luke, and Beef as normal. So we hope you enjoyed it. And this episode was sponsored by the Football Kit Factory. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, mate. Thanks for having me on, lads. Appreciate it.